What up, y'all? It's your hometown hero, Scott Lane, the Black Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. the real Adam Coleman. So, you riding with True ID. And, uh, yeah, it's been a while, man. Glad to be back up in here. Uh, you know, definitely um, it's been a lot going on that I want to catch you guys up on. Uh, you know, a lot of opportunities have been opening it up and doing a lot of you know speaking engagements and things like that. So um, probably next episode, I'll be uh, you know getting into just bringing you guys up to speed. But I will say this. I will say this. Um, I mean, I'm excited because, um, you know, when I first really got into apologetics, uh, it was pretty much, you know, just launching this podcast and, uh, you know, seeing what it would do. And uh, from then till now, you know, the Lord has opened up a lot of doors. Uh, the ministry is expanding, y'all. You know, we're try, really trying to take it to uh, to the next level and, uh, you know, just expand, uh, you know, get more content out there through through various different outlets. Uh, speaking engagements have definitely picked up. So, you know, I'll, I'll be getting into all that. But, um, you know, definitely some changes coming down the pipe. Good changes, you know. And, um, yeah, y'all just, you know, stay tuned for that. You know, definitely got some exciting things coming. Um, and with that being said... I want to give a special shout out uh, to my folks who I was hanging out with um, a couple of weeks ago in uh, Northern Virginia. You know, I think it was uh, McLean, Virginia. I was out there with the uh, the Maven organization. Uh, got a chance to, to teach, a, teach a couple sessions and uh, hang out with my man Tim Stratton and uh, also Tim Fox and uh, just the whole the whole uh, group out there, man. The church group that we was with uh, definitely had a great time out there, man. Uh, shout out to my man Ben Watkins. Uh, who came through as well, man. It was uh, pretty dope to, you know, to see him and, uh, you know, pick his brain a little bit and, uh, you know, chop it up um, in regards to some philosophy and whatnot. So, you know, love y'all, man. Shout out to y'all. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to catch up with y'all again soon. And, um, you know, um, before then, uh, a couple of weeks before that, I was in um, Detroit, man. I was out there in Detroit and, uh, you know, kicking it with Pastor Kevin Lawson, the whole church family out there. Uh, had a great uh, Urban Apologetics Conference, man, had a phenomenal time. Uh, shout out to uh, Pastor Jerome Gay, who was there, Vocab Malone. Uh, the, the other brother who, who taught, his name escapes me right now, but he did a phenomenal job as well. We had a blessed time, man, and um, you know, definitely be giving y'all some more details on that. But, you know, just you know, had a great time, man, getting out of town, teaching or whatever, you know what I'm saying, and, um, you know, getting this this uh, Urban Apologetics out there. And um, it's really cool because, you know, when I first started just a couple of years ago, you know, there was a pretty much a drought of resources and, uh, you know, conferences going on where people could learn about things like, you know, the comedics or Hebrew Israelites and you know, how to respond to them. Uh, and even, even Nation of Islam, you know, with them being around as long as they have, you know, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, churches just haven't been, you know, giving attention to how to respond to these different groups, you know. So that's just been really exciting to see kind of, um, I don't know if I would call it an explosion, but, you know, definitely a, a sharp increase, you know, in churches and, and pastors being more aware that we need to be discussing these things and equipping uh, the saints to be able to defend the faith, man. Uh, so definitely is excited about that. And then kind of doubling it back to the Maven experience, it was cool to kind of step outside of the urban apologist role and t just kind of really do, uh, you, know, t you know, tap into some other branches of apologetics. So that was really cool, man. I, I definitely enjoyed that as well. So, um, you know, with that being said, man, I mean, a couple of people have hit me up, you know, recently um, in regard to, you know, doing speaking engagements. You can always hit me up at TrueID7 at Gmail. And, uh, you know, I'd definitely love to come on out. Uh, but, you know, let's fast forward a little bit, man. Um, I want to talk about my man, Frederick Douglass, one of the all time greats, man. Uh, you know, there's no doubt, you know, in terms of uh, figures of you know, African-American history. Uh, Frederick Douglass is by far, uh, you know, my, my favorite person, uh, to, just to research, look over his writings and just kind of just really study how he thought, uh, just a, a brilliant, brilliant mind, man. Um, just very interesting. I mean, to be, quite frankly, just kind of being real, like when I sit down and write articles and stuff like that, there's a, there's a couple writers, um, you know, from our African-American heritage that I, I'll sit down and read 
before I, I write one of my articles, you know, and it's, it's, and Frederick Douglass is definitely one of those, you know, I'll sit down and read some of his stuff and it's just phenomenal to me that you have this man who was a African enslaved person, um, you know, he escapes to freedom and it's pretty much self-taught, you know, in terms of reading and writing and so on. And just his command of the English language. I mean, it just really just puts me to shame. <laughs> and so I feel like I, you know, it's him and there's a few others too, but, you know, definitely him. You know, I like to go back and read it to kind of challenge myself a little bit. You know what I mean? To to almost kind of live up to that uh, literary history, uh, you know, that, that we have, you know, um, as uh, Africans. Uh, in America. So, you know, definitely, uh, definitely, you know, one of the guys that certainly inspired, you know, you know, much of what I do. And um, yeah, I was, I was just talking to a friend of mine the other day, man, it's just, it's amazing to me how th there's so many figures of African American history that in a way get sanitized, um, or maybe I can just put, say, you know, de-Christianized, you know, you hear about them being uh, active in civil rights or, you know, maybe if it's an inventor, you know, you hear hear them, uh, you know, some of their achievements in that regard. But it's like the Christian element, the Christian element of, um, you know, what they brought to the table just kind of gets, you know, expunged out of, you know, history as it's normally reported. And Frederick Douglass is no exception. I mean, we hear about Frederick Douglass as an abolitionist. Uh, but how often do you hear about Frederick Douglass as the minister that he was? You know, Frederick Douglass, and this is what trips me out. This is why, you know, when I hear, um, you know, some of these these woke folks, you know, uh, conscious community folks, rather, who are out here talking about, you know, what has the church done and the church ain't done nothing this and, you know, just bad mouth in the church and, and Christianity um, in general. And I'm like, fam, have you have you read some of the autobiographies and, and, and personal accounts of the most notable freedom fighters? Uh, for African Americans here, here in this country, have have you read, uh, Ida, you know about Ida B. Wells and, and the role that her faith played in you know what she was doing? I mean, and, and really standing up against lynching in her day, or Harriet Tubman, and or, or to come back to it, Frederick Douglass, <laughs> like I said, perfect example. Um, I mean, Frederick Douglass, we're talking about a guy who was a licensed minister at his church, taught Sunday school. He was what they called an exhorter. I mean, he would preach. You know, um, we're talking about a guy who I mean, this this is a man right here. Uh, when you look at look at his story, he, he wanted to start what was called a, a Sabbath school. Right. Which is pretty much like a Sunday school. But he wanted to start a you know, so-called Sabbath school. And in the area that he was in, he was approached by some white folks who threatened him, you know, threatened his life. It was like, look, you better not you better not start a Sabbath school and be out here teaching the Bible. You know, and consequently, you know, from that, people be learning how to read and things of that nature. It was like, bro, you better not. As a matter of fact, he, you know, he's actually he quotes him in one passage of his autobiography. I don't have it right here in front of me, but they said something to the effect of um, they said to Frederick Douglass, look, if you don't want to get two bullets in your chest, just like Crispus Addicts did, then we suggest to you, you not start that Sabbath school. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I mean, this is you know, it, it's, it's, it's so funny because. It's not funny, but it's just amazing that just the level of hypocrisy, given the fact that Christmas Addicts, uh, a man who was you know half black, or I guess we, we could say at least part black, uh, they would have called him a, a mulatto. Um, you know, he was the first person that we noted that, that is noted to have died for the cause of American Revolution. You know, it sparks off the Revolutionary War. He was the first martyr and casualty of the Revolutionary War. A black man. And so, you know, fast forward some years later, here are these these white folks coming to, to Frederick Douglass, like, look, if you don't want to die like that guy, <laughs> as it, the guy who, who died for our freedom. But anyway, if you don't want to die like that guy, then we suggest you not start that, that Sabbath school. It's just the hypocrisy is just uh, is, is amazing. But anyway, you know, my point is, you know, Frederick Douglass, man, like he had a profound, profound faith a profound faith, an enduring faith that fueled much of what he did. We're talking about a man who is, is of course, known for his um, abolitionist newspaper, the North Star. Frederick Douglass published the North Star from the basement of an AME Zion church. Think about that. Think about that. 
like I said, we got all these, you know, Johnny come lately, Afrocentric, you know, religions, ideologies, spiritual systems, whatever you want to call them, that, you know, want to badmouth the church, you know, and it's like, fam, we the ones that been doing all the work. <laughs> like you, you come in after the fact, after the foundation has already been laid for civil rights by which you can exercise your, your freedom of speech, you know, and, and, and freedom of religion and all that to do what it is what you want to do after we secured all that. Now you want to come in and, and bite the hand that, that has fed you for all these years. You know, it's just, it's, it's crazy to me. But a- anyway, you know, that, that's, that's just going way beyond, um, you know, the topic that I got here for today. So uh, what I want to talk about today is an experience I had um, a couple of weeks ago, in fact, you know, when I was up there, um, actually I was up in Northern Virginia teaching and then I went the following week because uh, it was my wife's birthday and uh, we were celebrating that. And, um, you know, a friend of hers got us some tickets to the African-American History Museum up there in um at the Smithsonian, you know, so y'all know I'm, I was all over that. I've been trying to get there for like a minute anyway. So, you know, I'm, I was probably, I mean, this is something that we were doing to celebrate my wife's birthday, but I was more hyped than her, man. And so, um, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I, I still owe her some payback because, um, when we got there, uh, you know, we got the three kids with us, you know, um, our, our three kids and, uh, my son just started wilding, man. My two year old, he was just, just wilding out crying and, upset about, you know, whatever he was upset about. And um, so my, you know, my wife was the only one who, who could uh, comfort him. So she actually ended up sitting in the hallway with him for the majority of the time that we was there. And, uh, you know, I was like, so yeah, uh, I, I can still go walk around. Right. And so she wasn't even going to fight me on it, man. She know how I am about black history. So I ended up walking around, you know, having a blast, you know I mean? For anybody who's been following me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, I mean, you see, uh, you know, the, the pictures that I posted up, I was having the time of my life up in there, man. Well, my wife was, um, <laughs> basically barely made it past the, the hallway cause she was, uh, taking care of my son and kind of keeping him straight. So I, so I now owe her another trip. We got to go back there. Um, but yeah, I had a blast, man. It was a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. I mean, I, you know, shoot, I study this stuff, uh, all the time, as, as you might imagine. And there was just so much, man, so much detail that I, I had never heard, man. I'm writing down names and, um, you know, just just events that I'd never heard of. So I could, uh, you know, bring it back to you guys here at the show, you know. So had, I definitely had a blast at the um, African-American History Museum. And so uh, one of the things I think is pretty dope is that they have like these different quotations, uh, you know, posted up on the walls and stuff. So as you walk through, you can see. Uh, you know, these different quotes from, you know, our forefathers and, and for our mothers, you know, uh, making statements about their experiences and, and their thoughts on America and just highlighting just different aspects of the African-American experience. Um, and I just thought it was, it was really powerful, man. So many uh, powerful quotes. And so what I was doing was, you know, you know, kind of having you guys in mind and, you know, folks who follow me on Instagram, I wanted to kind of, um, take pictures of the quotes that I found to be pretty profound, you know, and just kind of post them up and share them on social media and just kind of, just so you can see what I'm seeing, you know, um, you know, maybe everybody might not get a chance to go to the Smithsonian uh, to that museum. So, you know, I figured I'd share a little bit, uh, some things that, that stuck out to me and, you know, it was really, um, you know, interesting on a personal note because, you know, there were so many, you know, instances in which something I talked about on the show, um, was, you know, displayed right there at the museum. I mean, so for example, I'm walking through, um, and if anybody who's, who's heard me, um, present, you know, live or, or even here on the show, I'm thinking about episodes like the bigger picture part one and two. I mean, you've heard me talk about, um, WL boss and his quote about how they didn't want slaves to get any religion. And, um, but you know, something just, you know, told them about, about God. Well, they had that quotation playing, um, you know, and kind of like this overhead, you know, audio uh, playback thing that was kind of like on a loop. They had that quotation playing. It was just really cool. You know, it was like, man, you know, that's something that I talk about all the time, you know, so I could really uh, relate to that. You know, so anyway, I'm taking pictures and, uh, you know, getting different quotes, post them off Instagram. And I came to this one quote that that really challenged me, you know, um, and I mentioned this on, on uh, you know, social media the other day. I posted the quote. So for anybody who's been following it, they know where I'm going. But, um, you know, it really challenged me, you know, when, when I saw it. And by challenge, I mean, um, I'm, you know, I'm a mental health professional by trade. So, you know, just as a matter of self-awareness, I'm always keeping tabs on uh, when I have, like, strong 
you know, immediate, you know, emotional reactions to things. I always kind of ask myself, like, you know, why? What's behind that? You know? And so um, I came to this quote, right? I'm, I'm just going to read the quote. It's from a, a gentleman named Spotswood Rice uh, from 1864. You know, so we're talking right about the end of the, the Civil War. And uh, he, Spotswood Rice says this. He says, quote, whether freemen or slaves, the colored race in this country have always looked to the United States as the promised land of universal freedom, end quote. Huh. You know, <laughs> it, it just, you know, when I, when I read that, it was like, oh man, wow. You know, and quite frankly, uh, just so, again, I'm just being real with y'all, man. You know, so often as I'm doing so-called urban apologetics and really just apologetics in general, you have people that want to, um, you know, water down, you know, the African-American experience. They want to kind of sugarcoat it and sweep it under the rug. I get people all the time, man, who don't understand the importance of just really grappling with the the ethical implications, uh, past and present, you know, of America's history, you know, and what that means when it comes to preaching the gospel in certain contexts. And so, you know, you have people who just want to kind of take a more sanitized approach to American history. And so I feel like I'm often having to present, you know, just facts, man. Like, look, let's just really grapple with this stuff. This, you know, X, Y, and Z really happened. You know, slavery really happened. It wasn't like, you know, um, you know, Jim Crow was just, you know, eons ago. My parents drank from water fountains that were marked for colored folks. They had to go in the back door of restaurants. I mean, this is not something um, we're talking about distant past. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, think about it. I mean, particularly for believers. I mean, you look at the Middle East today and understanding how prophecy works and that kind of stuff and, and chains of events. I mean, we're looking at a mess over in the Middle East based upon something that happened between, you know, Abraham and Hagar, you know, thousands of years ago, whenever that, you know, happened. You know what I'm saying? And we're still dealing with the, the fallout from it today. So it's just amazing to me how people can, um, look at slavery and Jim Crow and, and, and all that being really from a historical standpoint, just a drop in the bucket of time ago and just think that, okay, we're good now. Like it's, there, there's no connection between us and that history. It, it just, it just amazes me, you know? And um, I, it's, it's like, I tell people sometimes that like, I think that there are people who uh, are of the perspective that we live in this uh, completely post-racial America and, you know, racism was kind of like a, a cold that America had and then got over it. Well, I'm not I'm like, no, it's, it's not that you had a cold is that America had bronchitis. <laughs> like you, know, you had the flu. You know, it wasn't just some common cold that just went away and uh, we no longer have to deal with it. You know what I'm saying? That's that's just not uh, the fact of the matter. And I understand that's uncomfortable, you know, for a lot of folks. But um, I'm a realist. I mean, I think we have to we have to grapple with things as they are. Uh, so anyway, you know, I find myself having to often present the um, the side of American history that people are uncomfortable with, you know, um, but I think it's necessary to be intellectually honest and, and morally honest about um, about who we are as a nation and, and where we are as a nation. Right. But then there's this this other element. Right. There's this other side where. America has, you know, this this value to it that people like Spotswood Rice and some other folks that, that I could name saw it, you know. And I mean, I'm talking about in the midst of slavery. Again, Spotswood Rice is is making this quote that people of African descent have always seen America as being like the promised land of universal freedom. He's saying that in 1864, you know, uh, the, the Civil War doesn't end until 1865. Right. So he's, he's talking about as people are in chains, you know, this is what he's he's communicating. And you can see uh, the same thing communicated amongst uh, Frederick Douglass, which we'll see in a minute. Um, we're talking about, um, geez, um, Absalom Jones. I, I read uh, um, a, a sermon that Absalom Jones made uh, about a year or so ago. And people can go back and check out that episode. But you, you can kind of see in, in his words as well. There's this appreciation for something about America that quite frankly, it's almost hard to digest it to some extent, 
you know, um, and I think there's a reason for that. I think there's a reason for that. I think that for somebody like myself, you know, when you first start really, um, when you kind of step out of, you know, the ninth grade, ninth or 10th grade version of America's history, and, and you really start to, to dig into, you know, just different aspects of it and some of the just true atrocities that have happened here on American soil toward people of African descent, you don't want to let America off the hook, Right. And it's not so much a matter of bitterness or unforgiveness or whatever. It's just you don't want to downplay a, a moral reality, you know. Um, and I think that's right. I think it, I think it's right to not. Um, it, it's right to to forgive. It's right to move forward. But it's not right to, in your moving forward, downplay the moral reality, you know, for which you have you know come to some resolution or, or what have you. You know, and so when people look at the Holocaust, for example, uh, when we look back at the Holocaust, um, we can say that, you know, Germany is not currently uh, uh, gassing Jews and having concentration camps and all those kinds of things. Uh, You know, that war is over. But we are rightly upset when we think about what happened. You know, it's right to, to look back on that historical reality and say that was wrong. You know, they ought not to have done that. As a matter of fact, I was at the Holocaust Museum um, just the week before. I went to the uh, African-American Museum and it's just so fascinating to me, (laughs) you know, that, um, you know, we have, um, you know, people when it comes to slavery, slavery, you know, they want to say things like, oh, get over it. It was in the past. Why you bring it up? And yet, you know, we have a Holocaust Museum. You know, where people say things like never forget, you know, things like that, you know, when it comes to the Holocaust or I mean, same thing with 9-11. They do the same thing. They say things like never forget, you know, uh, but when it comes to slavery, oh, no, no, that was in the past. I mean, you know, you need to get over bitterness and whatnot. Like there's this this strange double standard, you know, and I I think there's a reason for that. I, I think there's I think that when it comes to the Holocaust, um, given the fact that America was essentially, you know, in the hero role in that conflict and freeing people who were truly, you know, uh, being victimized in the worst possible way, because we were in the hero role, it's easy for us to say, you know, never forget with respect to the Holocaust, you know, because we can look upon it and see ourselves in a positive light, you know, and by ourselves, I'm, I'm talking about it in a national sense, right? Um when it comes to um, 9-11, I think it's the same thing. I mean, we, you know, something was done to us, you know, as a nation. You know, we can look upon it and mourn and say, never forget, and not have any qualms with that, you know, because, you know, again, you know, we weren't the villain here. You know, um, World War II, we were the hero. When it comes to 9-11, we were, you know, um, attacked, we were the victim, and, you know, we grew from it, got back up and fought terrorism. You know, we can kind of, again, see ourselves in a positive light. But with slavery, it's a little bit different. With slavery, it's different because we weren't the hero in that one. You know, at least not in a clear cut, unequivocal way. You know, Uh, you know, America has to eat that one a little bit. You know, Um, I just posted something up on on my um, wall, I think a day or so ago about black loyalists. And it's referring to those who fought on behalf of England, you know, during the Revolutionary War because um, they had been enslaved in America and were promised by the English to be freed if they fought for uh, for England. And so you have in the Revolutionary War, you have some who are fighting for England against America for their slavery, for, for their freedom, rather. They're fighting against America for their freedom. And you also have some people on the rev- on the American side of the Revolution War. You have some people, some uh, African Americans, um, who are fighting for against England. <laughs> you know, hoping that they'll be able to secure their freedom if they fight uh, for the colonies. You know, so it's just very strange. I mean, th- th- there's this strange duality. You know, uh, right there in the Revolutionary War, where you have people of African descent fighting against America on the one end and for America on the other end, um, both with the hopes of securing their freedom. The same thing with war of 1812. A lot of people don't talk about that, but you know, it's come up uh, fairly recently, uh, at least in the last couple of years with um, the protests of Colin Kaepernick and uh, that, that uh, 
now infamous third stanza of the national anthem, you know, where it refers to, you know, the hireling and the slave and uh, it was brought attention to the war of 1812 because that's when the uh, uh, national anthem was written. Um, and it's, it's a historical fact. I mean, you have people who are of African descent fighting against America and, you know, during the war of 1812 to secure their freedom, to secure their individual freedom. Uh, America was, you know, on the wrong side of that issue with respect to them. You know, so there's that side of the history. But then even with all of that, even with all that, you still have to come back to the spots with rices who say things like whether, quote, free, whether freemen or slaves, the color race in this country have always looked to the United States as the promised land of universal freedom. You still got to digest that. You've got to digest that. You know, um, I think that it's easy to, you know, when you start, you know, I guess getting woke or whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, it's easy to just kind of take a broad brush and just become very anti-American. I think that's easy. And I think that maybe when people first start to do the research, that's the the immediate reaction. But as you kind of chew on it, as you, you study further, you realize that there's some nuance and some texture, you know, to that. Uh, dynamic there to where it's not just this kind of cookie cutter thing, you know, where you can just make hasty conclusions about uh, America's heritage and history. Um, the fact of the matter is um, there's this other side to it. There's the Spotswood Rice side to it, you know, where our ancestors are expressing this, this value that they see in America. And we have to understand that we have to ask ourselves the question, why would somebody who's you know, in the face of slavery and so forth, why would they make such a statement? What did they see that, that, you know, maybe in 2019, I'm, I'm at distance from, I, I can't quite see it. You know, what did they see, um, you know, for, for the, the, the people that, you know, fought for, you know, again, there's there, actually, there's several um, African-Americans who, who fought for the revolution. I've got like a 300 some page book, you know, sitting on my shelf right now called the color Patriots written by, um, my man uh, Cooper, William Cooper Nell, written in 1852. And he, um, you know, just chronicles all these different uh, people of African descent who fought for the revolution of their of their own will, you know, uh, presumably, uh, you know, fighting for what they believe to be freedom, you know, or, or, or the opportunity to gain freedom. You know, what did they see? What you know, why were those individuals willing to take a bullet for a country in which there was so much of slavery and oppression? Hmm. You know, there's a lot to that. There's a lot to that. Um, I mean, on the one hand, one could say that, you know, having been disconnected from the African continent, I mean, it was pretty much a, a no going back kind of a thing. I mean, I think that's, that's very real. You know, there are stories of, of people trying to go back and, and, and uh, you know, not being successful because they've just you know, been away for so long. They've been disconnected from the, the motherland and you can't just hop back. On, on West Africa and think you're going to be all right. I mean, you don't speak the language, you don't know the culture, you, you know, there's just so many different things. I mean, that's for many people, maybe that alone, you know, was just, uh, you know, made, uh, you know, figuring things out here in America, a more viable option. Uh, but again, even aside from that though, you know, you've got to grapple with, you know, what they had to say, what many of, of our ancestors had to say about America and seeing some value there. So, I think I probably said enough about that, but just to kind of go back to my experience as I'm sitting there um, at the African American Mu uh, History Museum, um, I'm going to be completely honest with you. You know, I've been taking, you know, photos of different quotations and facts of things that, um, you know, coincided with stuff that I teach on the um, teach on the show. And there was this, you know, there was this small but very real um, uh kind of compulsion on, on the inside. I was like, man, I, you know, do I really want to take a photo of this, of this spot with right crows? Do I really want to, I don't know if I really want to do that. You know what I'm saying? I, was, I, don't, I don't want to, you know, uh, tip the scale in the other direction here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I guess, you know, this is out of sync with what, you know, much of um, people are, are familiar with, you know what I'm saying, in terms of uh, the African-American experience. You know, I don't know if I really feel like going there. But, you know, for me, um, it was a quick thought, you know, but for me, it was like, you know, I, I got to take it. I got to I got to take a photo here. I got to get I got to capture this as well, 
because this is every bit as much of the African American experience as you know uh, a quote from Henry Highland Garnett or somebody else who's you know chastising America for its ills and, and whatnot. You know this Spotswood Rice perspective is very real, also, and quite frankly, just you know as a matter of intellectual honesty. You know, I just wouldn't feel right about myself, you know, of just kind of sweeping that under the rug and not really grappling with it. Um, and then the other side of it is, too, is, you know, um, I mean, I, I really do treat this platform um, as something that's bigger than myself. This is a ministry for me, you know, and I feel like I've got to be responsible with it. So I can't, you know, just give people um, a myopic or, or um, I guess, um I guess, short armed version of history when there's more to be said about it, you know, uh, particularly if I think it'll help us grow. So I want to address it here on the show. And um, I want to do something a little bit different um, as I kind of show you how I grapple with this issue. I'm just going to kind of give you give a few thoughts. Uh, but I want to actually read a little bit um, from my man, Frederick Douglass. Actually, I was um, up to about three, three, three thirty last night. Um because originally I was going to read the whole uh, speech, but that mode is getting too long, man. I think it would have been about like an you know, hour and a half and some change long. So I decided to just kind of take some portions that I'm going to read and then you know, explore a little bit of, in terms of how it um, relates to what I just uh, what I was just talking about. You are under the British crown. Your fathers esteemed the English government as the home government and England as the fatherland. This home government, you know, although a considerable distance from your home, did, in the exercise of its parental prerogatives, impose upon its colonial children such restraints, burdens, and limitations, as in its mature judgment, it deemed wise, right, and proper. But your fathers, who had not adopted the fashionable idea of this day of the infallibility of government and the absolute character of its acts, presumed to differ from the home government in respect to the wisdom and the justice of some of those burdens and restraints. They went so far in their excitement as to pronounce the measures of government unjust, unreasonable, and oppressive, and altogether such as ought not to be quietly submitted to. I scarcely need say, fellow citizens, that my opinion of those measures fully accords with that of your fathers. Such a declaration of agreement on my part would not be worth much to anybody. I would certainly prove nothing as to what part I might have taken had I lived during the great controversy of 1776. To say now that America was right and England wrong is exceedingly easy. Everybody can say it. The dastard, not less than the noble brave, can flippantly discant on the tyranny of England towards the American colonies. It is fashionable to do so. But there was a time when to pronounce against England and in favor of the cause of the colonies tried men's souls. They who did so were accounted in their day plotters of mischief agitators and rebels, dangerous men. To side with the right against the wrong, with the weak against the strong and with the oppressed against the oppressor. Here lies the merit and the one which of all others seems unfashionable in our day. The cause of liberty may be stabbed by the men who glory in the deeds of your fathers. But to proceed. Feeling themselves harshly and unjustly treated by the home government, your fathers, like men of honesty and men of spirit, earnestly sought redress. They petitioned and remonstrated. They did so in a decorous, respectful and loyal manner. Their conduct was wholly unexceptionable. This, however, did not answer the purpose. They saw themselves treated with sovereign indifference, coldness and scorn. Yet they persevered. They were not the men to look back. On the 2nd of July, 1776, the old Continental Congress, to the dismay of the lovers of ease and the worshipers of property, clothed that dreadful idea with all the authority of national sanction. They did so in the form of a resolution. And as we seldom hit upon resolutions drawn up in our day, whose transparency is at all equal to this, it may refresh your minds and help my story if I read it. Quote, Resolved that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown 
and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be dissolved. End quote. Citizens, your fathers made good that resolution. They succeeded, and today you reap the fruits of their success. The freedom gained is yours, and you, therefore, may properly celebrate this anniversary. The 4th of July is the first great fact in your nation's history, the very ring bolt in the chain of your yet undeveloped destiny. Pride and patriotism, not less than gratitude, prompt you to celebrate and to hold it in perpetual remembrance. I have said that the Declaration of Independence is the ring bolt to the chain of your nation's history. So indeed, I regard it. The principles contained in that instrument are saving principles. Stand by those principles. Be true to them on all occasions, in all places, against all foes, and at whatever cost. Now, you know, Douglas, uh, he starts out pretty positive here, right? Um, and speaking of the, the founders, he refers to them as great men, brave, uh, wise, worthy to be esteemed by later generations, right? And uh, that's, you know, which I was talking about before. I think that really captures um, what I was referring to with Spotswood Rice is just seeing um, this, this value there, right? Um, obviously, these same founders were the ones who, you know, allowed for there to be chattel slavery, you know, as America was founded. I mean, obviously, it was already here because, you know, during the colonial period, chattel slavery was already in full tilt. Uh, but, you know, again, you know, these these uh, great men, as he refers to them, um, you know, the Thomas Jeffersons, the John Jays, the the uh, George Washingtons, they were all, you know, um, you know, sl slavery continues. Slavery continues um, in spite of uh, the fact that, you know, not to say that everybody, you know, particularly John Jay, I think I mentioned, I think he was anti-slavery. <clears throat> but nevertheless, this generation, this uh, great generation, he refers to them you know, slavery uh, persists on, on, on their watch. Right. And, um, you know, but, but he acknowledges this, uh, what he refers to as greatness, you know? Um, and it just makes me think about, um, you know, much of the, the current conversation here in America, at least over the last couple of years, I'm not going to say too much about this, but I, I just think it's fascinating with this whole make America great again thing, the MAGA hat. I mean, it's just very polarizing uh, slogan right now, you know, and uh, you got those who are just gung ho about it. Oh yeah, make America great again. You know they're they're all in. And then you have you know others who take the position of well, dog. When was it great in the first place? <laughs> you know what I'm saying like like you know when when was it great, bro? You know um, you know so you got both sides of the coin, and you know they go back and forth. But I mean to be honest with you, I mean just this is like my own little you know side. But I think it's actually kind of pretty silly, you know, to uh, condense real dialogue concerning the events and ethical realities of America's history down to uh, a campaign slogan. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like make America great again. It was, it was a campaign slogan, you know, it was something that was meant to be pithy, short attention grabbing and, and resonate with a particular you know group to, to garner support for votes. That's, that's what it was, you know? And I think that, I mean, really, why should a campaign slogan uh, supply the the parameters or the boundaries within which we assess this nation and its history. I mean, that's just kind of dumb, you know. <laughs> history just, you know, has uh has too much texture for that, you know. Um, and I think it really gets into, you know, wh what do people mean by great? You know, what do people mean by that? You know, um, if they mean great in relation to say other nations, you know, I mean, sure. I mean, obviously, I, I think America is is greater than you know, Nazi Germany or something like that. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of different, you know, nations that we could, we could throw out that are places I wouldn't want to live. Um, shoot. As a matter of fact, I mean, you know, with all his flaws, I wouldn't want to live anywhere other than America. You know, I mean, I, it's just what it is. What it is. I'm, I'm, I'm doing all right right now. You know, I know there's a lot of folks that aren't, and I have compassion for them. I try to help them out, but I can't see myself moving somewhere else and, and doing a whole lot better. So for, you know, for better, or for worse, you know, this is where I'm at. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, so if we're talking about like relative greatness, then I mean, sure, I, I guess you can make a case for that. I guess you can make a case for that. But um, it gets into, uh, you know, greatness is in the eye of the beholder, I guess, kind of a thing, you know. And so, you know, maybe somebody can make a case for that. Um, but if you're talking about greatness in maybe a more fixed, uh, objective sense, you know, as in, you know, coming from a biblical standpoint, you know, greatness 
um, you know, I guess moral greatness being measured against, uh, you know, the objective standard of, of God's goodness. You know, if we're talking about moral issues. Then I, I don't see how any nation could consider itself to be great. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how you could you could manage that. You know, it's just kind of funny, man. I, I was um, I used to do uh, mentoring and stuff, and sometimes I would have to take my my kids to um, like the little league games and stuff like that, man. And you have these old heads, you know, forty, fifty years old, you know, talking about um, that. It's crazy. I just said old heads, forty, fifty. I just turned thirty nine, so I guess I'm an old head now or about to be. But anyway, you know, you have these old heads talking about how when they was in in little league. Um, you know, they, oh man, I averaged 10 yards a carry, you know, as a running back or something like that. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, like you know, almost 30, you know, 35 years ago in, in Little League, I averaged, you know, 10 yards a carry and I had, you know, a thousand yards in a season, you know, in Little League or something, you know, it's just, just stuff like that, you know. And I guess that's cool. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that, you know what I mean? I mean, they still take pride in it. But, you know, imagine if that guy who's proud of his Little League stats were to walk into a room full of NFL Hall of Famers. And, you know, you got like, you know, I don't know, Bo Jackson or, uh, you know, um, uh, I'm about to say Emmitt Smith, but I don't want to give Dallas no shine, man. I'm not, I don't rock with Dallas like that. But uh, let's just say Emmitt Smith, you know, one of you know, those great running backs. You know what I mean? You got this guy coming in talking about his little league, you know, running stats. I mean, they, <laughs> I mean, I mean, what could they do but laugh at the guy? You know, because compared to, you know, NFL level great, you know, uh, little league great doesn't really mean too much, you know, and um, you know. So, so likewise, I think you know. It, I, honestly, I tend to take the second approach. I, I try to. I think there's there's only one moral law, and I think that we would do well to live our lives in light of it rather than something lesser, you know. Um, so it just doesn't really resonate with me, you know. I guess when people talk about uh, this greatness in a more temporal um, kind of comparing ourselves to other people sense that kind of relative sense um because i just think that there's a greater greatness you know that we ought to be uh looking towards you know that's that's my perspective you know um but nevertheless you know um uh frederick Douglass sees greatness there he sees greatness in that first uh you know generation of um of americans the, the founders particularly and he's not alone in that i mean there, there's uh I could pull up other speeches and sermons right now, you know, where you have other African-Americans from that era and earlier who who would agree, you know, um, and if they don't necessarily agree about the founders, I mean, they would agree that there was greatness here in this country uh, to be held on to, you know, by <clears throat> by, um, you know, rather than just letting it go. Um, as a matter of fact, after the, uh, the Civil War, uh, well, really during and after the Civil War, you had a lot of people. Um, I guess on different sides of what they call the Negro problem, right? I mean, once you, if you were to allow all these slaves to go free, then, you know, what do you do with them? You know, where do they go? What, you know, what part uh, would they, you know, play in society? And, you know, there are different ideas about that. But one thing I can say is that uh, my understanding is that for the most part, um, this idea of immigrating and it's immigrating with an E, uh, immigrating back to Africa you know, leaving here in America and going back to Africa amongst like abolitionists and, and civil rights activists and people like that, people like Frederick Douglass, that idea was very much frowned upon. It's very taboo. You know, the notion that, you know, um, people of African descent were just going to pick up and leave and go back. I'm not saying that nobody held to it. I mean, uh, certainly there were some who, who felt that way, but in some circles, I mean, that was a very, um, like I said, it's very much so looked down upon, you know? So whereas, um, you know, like Abraham Lincoln, uh, on the other hand, you know, he was on record as holding in the view that the races aren't equal and therefore should be separate, you know, as in, you know, send black folks back to Africa. I mean, that was at least his his um, perspective going into his presidency. Uh, you know, that view amongst Africans, nah, man, they, they wasn't riding with that. <laughs> you know, they wasn't riding with that. I mean, over and over again, you know, you see um, kind of a two part argument in that, first of all, you know, we and our forefathers, you know, we put some some uh, blood, sweat and tears into this this American project here. You know, we, we got some skin in the game, you know, um, we, you know, we, we gave something for America to be uh, where it is. And there's no way in the world that we're going to allow all the hard work that we put in and, you know, our forefathers to put in. You know, we're not going to let these white folks just ball off it <laughs> and we just dip back to Africa with nothing. No, nah, absolutely not. Absolutely not. 
So that was one side. And then you have others who, in addition to that, would say, we're not going back to Africa for the simple fact that, you know, there is something valuable here. You know, African-Americans, many of them saw something of value here in America in the face of racism, slavery and oppression. They believed that they had a chance to make something of themselves here in America. You know, I think there's there's reason they have for that that, I, that I'll get into uh, here in a moment. Uh, but first, I just want to you know read a quick uh, another quick quote. And then I'll, I'll explain kind of um, you know where I was going with that last point in a later section of um, what is uh, the 4th of July to the slave. Um, Douglas says this right here. He says, quote, fellow citizens, pardon me. Allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that declaration of independence extended to us? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar? And confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us. End quote. Now, see, here's where it starts to get a little dicey now. It starts to get a little dicey. You know, um, in the earlier part of uh, Frederick Douglass's speech, you know, he's you know speaking very positively. He's acknowledging uh, things that just kind of of their own for their own sake can be acknowledged as goods or, or, or great even, you know. But now he's switching gears on y'all a little bit and he's switching it up, you know, because he's acknowledged this, uh, this greatness, you know, um, that he identified in the, the founding generation and the, the uh, principles that they spoke of, uh, the Declaration of Independence and whatnot. Uh, but, in, but now, in addition to that greatness, there's this uh, acknowledgement of a distance between himself and that greatness, this distance between us and what the uh, the founding um, the founders of this country um, accomplished, you know, that greatness that he just spoke of, you know. And I guess if I could characterize it, um, I guess the way that makes sense to me is that you have this appreciation versus application, appreciation versus application. So you know, here's what I mean by that. So, you know, Douglas acknowledges um, you know, this bravery and wisdom, and all the things I've mentioned. And actually later on in the speech, he also talks about the Constitution itself and just the, the greatness that he, he sees in that as well. Um, as a matter of fact, one of his um, main brothers in arms uh, when it comes to abolitionism was uh, William Lloyd Garrison. And William Lloyd Garrison believed that the Constitution itself was what he called a slave document. It was something that was pro-slavery. Uh, but um uh, Frederick Douglass disagreed with that. He 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 was not of that uh, perspective. He believed that the Constitution uh, contained within it um, principles that were anti-slavery, you know, and could be um, you know stood upon in their efforts for abolitionism. You know, that's that's the point in which him and, and Lloyd Garrison disagreed. Uh, so he, and and he uh, alludes to that li- later on in the speech. But with that being said, again, this appreciation uh, for that greatness and uh, versus the application. Um, The fact of the matter is this, (laughs) you know, when you think about the Declaration of Independence itself, you know, where it speaks of, you know, governments derive their power from the consent of the governed. And yet at the same time, you've got chattel slavery going on where you have these people who are subjugated for their labor, um, brutally subjugated for their labor um, without their consent. I mean, that's that's what slavery is. Right. So you have an entire nation um, willing to, to, you know, go to go to war, you know, go to war against uh, another government, which they believed, um, no, you know, did not derive its power from their consent. And yet at the same time, they've got, you know, power over these other folks, you know, these Africans and others, you know, um, without their consent. I mean, clearly a contradiction, an obvious contradiction, you know. Um, and so it makes it um, interesting. You know, you have this interesting dynamic where, you know, a lot of times people, they, you know, they want to quote the founders, Thomas Jefferson, uh, you know, Patrick Henry, you know, George Washington. Well, I'll kind of be t- you know, talking about those in a second. You know, but you have all these quotations, you know, these great quotes about, you know, morality and, and the role of morality and government and freedom and all these kinds of things. Um, but the fact of the matter is, you know, the cold, hard truth is that when they were making these statements, 
you know, for example, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and then are endowed with, um, you know, by their creator with these inalienable rights. You know, when they wrote that, they probably weren't thinking about people that look like me. <laughs> you know, in, in all likelihood, when you're talking about all men created equal, they were not referring to Africans. They, they didn't believe that they were men in any same sense as, you know, they took Europeans to be the case, you know. And by they, I do not mean to, to say that there was this unanimous, you know, uh, perspective um, along those lines amongst the founders, but certainly it was enough to um, allow for the system of child slavery to go forward and for there to be this um, this back and forth and ultimate um, just crime of all crimes against African people to continue in America. So, um, you know, perfect example, you know, Thomas Jefferson, I mentioned him a second ago, you know, um, there's actually a guy uh, by the name of Abby Henri Gregoire. Okay. And he wrote a book called the inquiry concerning the intellectual and moral faculties and literature of Negroes in 1810. That's when he wrote in 1810. Now, Gregoire's whole book is about, you know, looking into uh, the, the mental faculties and morality and, and cultures amongst Negroes, so-called Negroes, um, and demonstrating that they are indeed human beings. They're indeed, um, you know, men just as white men are men. That was the whole point of uh, Abri Gregoire's uh, book. And uh, interestingly enough, um, if you understand what's going on in the uh, conscious community today, the comedic movement, you know, in in one way kind of owes, you know, their movement to some extent to uh, Abri Gregoire because he was actually, you know, one of the first to uh, bring, I guess, uh, Egyptomania, <laughs> which I've heard it referred to, to, um, to, to the American colonies. I mean, he, he um, in his book, he used Egypt as an example of a civilization that was sophisticated and, and so forth. Uh, as an example of the fact that um, so-called Negroes are indeed uh, men. And so I bring him up to say that he actually sent a copy of his work to Thomas Jefferson uh, in an effort to convince Thomas Jefferson uh, that, hey, you know, these Africans that you got over there, you guys got it all wrong. You know, these are, are men that you are um, just stealing labor from, you know, these aren't just, you know, uh, advanced animals. These are men just like you. And you guys got this whole slavery thing wrong. Um, obviously, you know, unfortunately, this was, um, you know, on Abby Gregoire's part. I mean, to no avail. You know, Thomas Jefferson um, was clearly instrumental in uh, making sure that slavery was solidified here in America. You know, he owned slaves himself. Uh, you know, obviously he had illicit relations with one of them, uh, Sally Hemings. And uh, though he did, um, you know, apparently free his slaves at the end of his life, I believe, um, obviously, when they were instrumental to him during his life, um, he didn't see fit to honor their full manhood and personhood. You know, and it's really sad. It's really sad because, again, you have this this um, this guy who, who wrote lots of great things. He was, you know, Thomas Jefferson was a smart guy. You can look at his writings and um, and see, hey, man, this this dude was was, was pretty sharp. Um, but when it comes to the matter of, of personhood and slavery, um, he was clearly on the side of one of the most heinous systems of subjugation in human history. You know, and he profited from it. He profited from it as long as he could till he died. You know, but hey, he wasn't alone. He wasn't alone. Right. Um, you know, <laughs> probably one of, the, you know, if maybe the most famous saying from you know this whole you know revolutionary period comes from your boy uh you know patrick henry you know the, the matter of fact there's a mall named for patrick henry just right down the road for me you know patrick henry mall and uh you know everybody knows that saying give me liberty or give me death everybody knows that saying well patrick henry was a slaveholder <laughs> so it's like the same dude who's talking about give me liberty or give me death is holding people in bondage and extorting them for labor i mean that's that's just crazy it's just a crazy that's that's hypocrisy on level like thousand right there. You know, um, it's wild, man. It's, it's just wild. Uh, you know, George Washington, same thing. Own slaves. You know, it is what it is. It's, it's, that's the truth. And uh, interestingly enough, um, later on, um, 
in, you know, in, in this Fourth uh, of July speech um, from Frederick Douglass, he mentions Abraham, uh, excuse me, uh, George Washington, and he makes an interesting comparison um, to the, the biblical Hebrews, where he says that um, the the people of this nation who were you know still slaveholding were kind of like the Jews when they said that we are of our father Abraham, and thought that they could appeal to the righteousness of Abraham and be in right standing with God, but yet they denied Abraham's God and their deeds. So he actually uses that example. And, you know, applies it to George Washington because, you know, apparently George Washington freed his slaves at the end of his life. And he was saying, like, you know, you're you're of your father, George Washington, who freed his slaves, you know, at the end of his life. But yet y'all won't free yours. So in the same manner, you know, you're trying to claim George Washington, but you're not even, you know, willing to go to the extent that he did in, in freeing the slaves. He obviously, at least at the end of his life, realized that that was the right thing to do, you know. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just, it's just fascinating, man. It's very fascinating. He kind of calls him out on that, you know, but I mean, of course, you know, you know how it goes, man. I mean, you talk about these things, uh, you know, you know, people want to say things, oh, you know, there were, there were men of their time, you know, there were men of their time. Well, you know, what would you have done if you had grown up and, and, you know, um, in a time where the prevailing view was that, uh, you know, Africans weren't slave, I mean, weren't, weren't human rather, weren't men. And, um, I just think that's a bad argument. I mean, it's, it's, that's just a terrible argument for a number of different reasons. I mean, the fact of the matter is there has never been a time in American history where there wasn't a moral witness, a recognizable moral witness against racism and slavery. You know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, you know, John, I've mentioned it on the show before, Jonathan Edwards and, and um, you know, George Whitfield, they was all about slavery. You know, people made that excuse for them. Oh, they were men of their time. But, you know, John Wesley, you know, he was a contemporary of theirs and knew these guys. And he was he was against slavery. He got the slavery question right. Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield got the slavery question wrong. You know, contemporaries. So so you can't make this excuse that, oh, well, they they were men of their times. Come on, fam. John Wesley was a man of their time. He didn't get it wrong. Right. So, yeah, that just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And, you know, even so, you know, with, um, you know, with the guys I've mentioned, you know, kind of getting back to the political side, you know, Thomas Jefferson, Henry, uh, George Washington. Come on, man. These guys weren't confused about the evils of slavery, dog. Come on now. I tell you what, you know, probably, you know, I, I could be wrong about this. I'm not a military historian, but, I, you know, maybe it's just new, new information to me. But I think among at least among the most unheard of wars that America has fought. Uh, was the Barbary Wars, B-A-R-B-A-R-Y, the Barbary Wars of 1801 and 1815. Now, mind you, America was a fledgling nation at that point. And within, say, the first, you know, 30 or so years, 20 or 30 years of their history, you know, um, they're fighting the Barbary Wars, 1801 and 1815. Now, what were the Barbary Wars? Well, you know, to put it short, um, the Barbary Wars... Um, had to do with these North African uh, Muslim pirates. They were called the Corsairs, right? The Corsairs. Uh, what they were doing is they were raiding um, European ships. You know, now it wasn't so much about you know African versus European for them. It was more so about Islam versus Christianity. They were raiding Christian ships. You know, who happened to be European, and I mean, shoot, they was wrecking shop, man. I'm talking about English, North Americans, Danish. I mean, whoever you know, French, whoever they could get, they was you know taking these ships, and they were kidnapping people you know from these ships and enslaving them in North Africa you know, Egypt and so forth. But, you know, the, the up in what they call the Barbary Coast, you know, these, you know, white folks, you know, North Americans included, were being um, kidnapped and sold into slavery. And so America goes to war in 1801 and 1815. America goes to war to put a stop to these white folks being abducted and sold into slavery. And slavery was still going on here in America. Full tilt, you know, would not end for some, let's say, you know, 50 years, you know, after that second Barbary War. So when it comes to the the big slavery question, I mean, there really was no slavery question, you know. Um, You know, they understood, you know, that uh, as actually I'll quote uh, Frederick Douglass again from um, later on in the same speech. He says, quote, there is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven 
that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. End quote. So obviously, you know, the founders recognize, you know, that slavery was, was wrong, you know, just in principle, you know. Matter of fact, I'm going to follow that up with a quote from Thomas Jefferson here. You know, it says that, quote, for in a warm climate, no man will labor for himself who can make another labor for him. This is so true that of the proprietors of slaves, very small proportion indeed are ever seen to labor. And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis? A conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are of the gift of God, that they are not to be violated, but with his wrath. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. So anyway, it just seems to me that, you know, um, I mean, honestly, if we just take Romans, uh, you know, chapter one and two. I mean, we've all been imprinted with that uh, sense of, you know, right and wrong, you know, as part of the Imago Dei. And we've been given the abis- ability to reason, you know, our way toward, um, you know, right and wrong, even though that that ability obviously has been, um, you know, both of those capacities have been impaired by the fall. Um, you know, nevertheless, you know, men are able to discern right from wrong, at least on one level or, or another. And with there having been this moral witness, you know, throughout American history, I just don't see any good reason, uh, you know, that we can just grant folks kind of this, you know, uh, broad brush excuse that I have honored that, you know. And so to bring it back to my point, you know, when I think about like, you know, the 4th of July and all that kind of stuff, you know, I, I feel, you know, kind of like Frederick Douglass. I mean, whereas there's these clear, you know, goods and, and, and things that can be acknowledged, you know, about having stood against, you know, what they believe to have been oppression from England and all that kind of stuff. You know, bravery is a, is a virtuous quality and all that, you know, and there are these um, ideas that were present about freedom and things like that, they were uh, to be appreciated in virtue of just in virtue of themselves. But in terms of their short arm application, you know, the fact that these principles and, and virtues weren't applied to people that look like me, you know, I do sense this, this distance between me and, you know, the, these great things, you know, and I think a lot of people grapple with that, you know, that just, that that's just, you know, for me, that's, one aspect of what makes it difficult for me to kind of get there with you, you know, when you're uh, celebrating America. Um, I'm not the kind of guy that's like anti-America. That's not really my thing. I mean, I, you know, I pretty much, um, I mean, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. I mean, that's just a fact of the matter. I, I, I've been overseas. I've been to, you know, some, um, I've been to Jamaica, I've been to Kenya, Ethiopia, I've been to some other places, you know, so I've, I've traveled a bit, you know, I've been fortunate to do so. Um, and from what I've seen, you know, now nah, I ain't trying to live nowhere else. Uh, but at the same time, at the same time, you know, that doesn't mean that I don't, um, you know, grapple, you know, with the moral realities of, of this nation and its history. You know, that's just a whole separate matter to me. I'll get back to that in a second. You know, so anyway, you know, let me kind of close out here. I'm going to you know finish up. But I want to touch on, you know, how was it then that um, uh, Frederick Douglass, in a sense, closed the gap between himself and. And what he acknowledged to be, you know, greater by this country and about the founders and so forth. And I think that he achieves that by focusing on the principles. It's all about the principles. So I want to repeat something that he said. He says, quote, I have said that the Declaration of Independence is the ring bolt to the chain of your nation's destiny. So indeed, I regard it. The principles contained in that instrument are saving principles. Stand by those principles. Be true to them on all occasions, in all places, against all foes, and at whatever cost. End quote. So, you know, it seems to me that in Douglas's speech, like how he um, finds a space at the table to, in some sense, celebrate the 4th of July is to focus on the principles that are to have that were contained in the Declaration of Independence. And like I said, he speaks on the Constitution as well. You know, now, again, you know, when it, when it talks about, um, you know, all men being created equal and those kind of things, I mean, likely it wasn't being um, consistent. I mean, obviously it wasn't consistently being applied um, to African peoples. I mean, we weren't in mind, you know, I don't think uh, at least across the board, you know, when those things were, were pinned down, you know. But nevertheless, you know, there were those principles were there, you know, and, you know, whatever they said of men that was right and eventually helpful to black folks, you know, it had to be reinterpreted, 
you know, in light of the fullness of truth, you know, and then so and people were held accountable to those ideals. So it's in the sense that, you know, those principles were there. Uh, they kind of had to be, you know, have the dust of racism and white supremacy dusted off of them in order for them to, you know, shine through in America's history. But they were present. They were present. And it seems to me that uh, Frederick Douglass is identifying, you know, those points, you know, identifying those principles that are to be highly regarded and, um, you know, drawing some sense of um, uh, heritage, you know, or connection with American heritage in that regard. You know, now, I mean, to kind of close it out, you know, a lot of people and there's so many other things I want to say, and I think I'll probably just bring it up in a different episode um, you know, some time ago I started this, uh, you know, social justice, um, you know, series, you know, where I was dealing with issues and kind of working my way through that. And, uh, yeah, I got a little sidetracked with it, you know, but, um, you know, for a number of reasons, um, you know, just, you know, traveling and things of that nature. And, um, you know, but with that being said, you know, I want to go ahead and bring that back, particularly, uh, because I've been seeing on, on Twitter, uh, some very unfortunate comments, you know, by a well-known apologist that, uh, has kind of, um, you know, compelled me to, you know, get back on these things because I think that we do need to have uh, balance in that conversation. So I'm going to be bringing that back. You know, I intended to anyway, but I'm, I'm about to hop on it. Um, you know, but anyway, you know, with that being said, you know, uh, so many people would want to say, well, gee, well, you know, the, Frederick Douglass was dealing with real slavery at that time. You know, what, uh, in what sense can someone in 2019 still be harboring or, uh, or sensing this sort of distance, you know, to a, a uh, reality that is no longer present. And, uh, you know, just, just really briefly, I, I just want to kind of, you know, highlight, I'm going to take 30 seconds. And I'll probably deal with this at another day, but, you know, there's two common threads that face, you know, the African-American today that face um, uh, Frederick Douglass at that time. Uh, I was recently listening to that, um, that, um, uh, I guess, presentation that ta Coast was giving to Congress, you know, when he was dealing with um, uh, uh, McCollum and he was correcting him on, on certain issues. And uh, first of all, you know, I think that he made a, a important distinction that I want to bring here that, you know, when we talk about America, you know, we got to be careful about what we mean or, or specific about what we, mean, what we mean. You know, do are we referring to America as a collective of people or are we referring to America as uh, the collective enterprise, you know, kind of like in, more in the abstract, you know. Now, when it comes to, you know, the collective of people, I mean, obviously, there's nobody that's alive today that's, uh, you know, was responsible for slavery. Uh, but when we talk about the collective enterprise, when we talk about that entity, America, you know, um, it is the same entity, you know, that um, perpetrated these these abuses that that we were speaking of. Right. Um and, you know, that notion is not something that's foreign to America. I mean, right now, you know, if you're a corporation, if you have or if you have a corporation in regard to how it functions in the law, it functions just like a person, you know, it has rights, it has obligations, you know, it can be held accountable for things. You know, corporations function in society in, in terms of uh, the legalities of it, um, just like a person does. You know, so we understand, I think, um, that this notion of a, a, of an abstract or an entity, a collective enterprise being held accountable for things. That's not something foreign to American law or something like that, or to America's, you know, perspective. Um, so even though, you know, the collective of individuals, you know, who directly are responsible for slavery are no longer with us, it is still the case, you know, that America itself, you know, this collective enterprise and the financial inheritances thereof are still a reality here today. Um, secondly, uh, I think the common thread would be just understanding the nuance between slavery as an institution versus racism, which was the underpinning of that institution of chattel slavery. And while it is the case that the institution of slavery is no longer a reality, uh, unfortunately for this country, uh, racism is, you know, racism is still alive and well today. And so the, the culprit behind slavery, uh, that, um, Frederick Douglass was facing is still the same culprit that we see today when people are, uh, you know, shot by police unjustifiably or certain uh, conditions are um, people are being subjected to, you know, um, that are very unfortunate and tied to racism. You know, so you still have these two common threads of racism and that collective enterprise that I think run uh, between what Frederick Douglass was confronting and what we see today.
And so therefore, you know, I do think there's this um, still this potential to experience this disconnect between recognizing, you know, the great things in this country. And there are some, you know, um, and understanding that, you know, American history ain't all bad. <laughs> I'm saying there's a lot of good. You know, America's done a lot of good things. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. And I think that um, there's a lot that can be said positively about it. Uh, but then also there's still room for this, uh, you know, uh, grappling with this dis- disconnect, you know. So I want to kind of leave out with that, you know, um, and, the re- you know, just to kind of, you know, give an understanding as to why I even brought all this up, you know. Um, I was kind of leave you with these two thoughts. You know, first of all, uh, I'm not set on it. You know, I mean, you know, this is kind of where I'm at right now. I'm kind of gives, given a perspective of, of how I think through things, because I think a lot of people do. I think this is a real issue for a lot of folks living within this tension uh, of the moral realities of American history. And yet at the same time, uh, the moral triumphs, you know, of American history and, and present even. You know, I can say that about the present as well. You know, there's that tension there. And I think that people of African descent in America have always grappled with and learned how to sustain themselves living within the tension, you know, between those two. And I think that we still have that today. And with respect to, you know, apologetics, if you're going to engage people um, on apologetics, you know, in the urban context, you have to understand this tension. You have to understand it. Um, I just got to be explicit and say this, you know, I, I'm, I'm just speaking on something. Maybe all of my listeners may not understand it, but I got to say what I see. The fact of the matter is when I'm on these different threads and things like that, you know, debating folks. Some of our white brothers and sisters, you know, who are engaging or believe they're engaging in urban apologetics are treating it as if it's like an extension of the social angst going on between leftists and Republicans or, you know, um, just kind of what's going on in society in general and not understanding that this is a mission field. You know, urban apologetics is not for you to build up ammunition against people with whom you disagree with on a political level. That's not what this is about. It's not about beating up black people, you know what I'm saying, because they rock with Black Lives Matter. That's that's not what this is about. This is about souls. And unfortunately, you know, I see a lot of that. You know, people get it twisted. And, you know, that's just, you know, that needs to stop, you know. That that needs to stop. You know. Um and you know, the you know, the other side of it is, you know, Compassion matters. <laughs> I'm saying, like, you know, if, if you're going to be, you know, um, out here doing apologetics, then do it with compassion. The Bible, t- as a matter of fact, we're instructed, you know, in First Peter that that's how we ought to be uh, going about this thing, you know, with grace and compassion. So, you know, that definitely needs to be said. Um, the other side of it is, is that we have people who are coming out of movements, whether it be Hebrew Israelites or, you know, comedics and other movements that are very anti-establishment, very anti-America, very anti-white. And as a matter of sanctification, you know, the ideas that they picked up from these movements um, need to be addressed in a biblical way such that they can grow towards Christ, you know, in these areas, you know. Um, But with that being said, I mean, you don't have to be an Uncle Tom to be a Christian. You can still hold on to moral convictions about what's right or wrong about the present or the past. But people need help in terms of working their way through these kinds of things in a way that that honors God. And so you have to understand it, you know what I'm saying? And you have to be able to grapple with these things so that, you know, we're not just, you know, preaching the gospel and then leaving people to their own ideologies to be, you know, to have their their faith shipwrecked later on down the road. You know, an aspect of apologetics, urban apologetics, is giving people responses such that they can, you know, have this barrier removed between them and the gospel. But then also we need to stick around and come alongside people to help them think through very real um, issues, you know, moral issues that pertain to you know race and, and identity and heritage and so forth. You know, um, sad to say, but, I, you know, I just was just talking about it um, not too long ago when I was in uh, McLean, Virginia. You have some people I've seen it, you know, where you've got maybe a uh, Hebrew Israelite or something like that or maybe some other group where they're kind of um, placing their their identity, their African or ethnic identity. Uh, in a place of idolatry above uh, the Imago Dei. Um, and then you have a person who's placing their American nationalism, you know, trying to so- so-called minister to them. And at the same time, they're really, you know, uh, being an apologist for America <laughs> or conservatism rather than just being an apologist for the gospel. So they're placing the, their Americanism, their American nationality in a place of idolatry above the Imago Dei. 
When really, if you're going to be, you know, out here ministering to folk, man, I'm not trying to convert somebody to being a patriot. I'm not trying to convert somebody to love in America. If you love America, you, great. If you don't, I really don't care. You know, my interest is salvific. I'm interested in preaching the gospel so that people come to know and grow with the Lord. Full stop. That's what I'm about, you know. And so, you know, we got to be aware of that, man. We got to, you know, help people to think through difficult questions. We got to make sure that our intents are right. And we have to understand this tension. You know, we have to understand this tension um, if we're going to engage people in a way that's uh, meaningful and I think helpful. I mean, the fact of the matter is, you know, um, <laughs> it's funny that like, I was bringing up the Declaration of Independence. And I, I, sometimes I ask people like, man, have, have you read it? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The Declaration of Independence is a whole document of discontent. It's a whole document of discontent, you know. So, you know, people talk about like, oh, man, you know, stop belly aching or whatever. I mean, I'm like, fam, like you do realize your founders established this country on gripes. <laughs> I'm saying, I mean, you know, if if, if, uh, if you would let some of these folks today tell it, I mean, they would have called the founders social justice warriors and cultural or 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 Marxists or whatever. <laughs> Neo-Marxists. That's you know, <laughs> Well, I guess it was before Marx. I don't know if they would have done that. But anyway, you know, um, I mean, it's just it's just fascinating to me, man. But um, this country was founded on discontent. And at the same time, it was also, you know, founded on hope, hope for something better. You know, and I think that within the African-American experience, you see a mirror image of that. You see this tension between discontent and hope. And I think that's about as American as apple pie. So I don't feel like I have to tuck in. You know, my discontent when I see something that is worthy of moral critique uh, concerning America and its history. You know, um, I am hopeful because of the principles, uh, biblical principles that that were woven into the foundation of this country such that it was able to grow past some of its most heinous uh, evils. You know, so I, for that reason, I do understand why Spotswood Rice or Frederick Douglass could see something uh, that would inspire hope in them uh, for, you know, uh, for their people, you know, to be able to make a way here. You know, there's this tension between the disconnect and the hope. And I think those are both very potent realities, you know. So, um, you know, being a patriot, you know, there's different ways I think you can do that. But, you know, in the spirit of, um, you know, those who saw something that was wrong and did something about it and believed that they could do better, I don't see anything different between that and where I sit. You know, so with that being said, man, I love y'all. You know, as always, uh, follow us on YouTube, uh, Facebook, iTunes, of course, with the podcast. Uh, hit me up on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, I would definitely would love for people to consider uh, supporting us through uh, Patreon. Uh, when I first started this uh, this podcast, man, it was just me hopping on the mic, you know, recording episodes. But things are growing now, man. It's, it's getting to the point where I can't. Uh, sustain it on my own. I mean, you can obviously tell because, <laughs> you know, sometimes I find it easier to drop episodes consistently than others, you know, but uh, I need some help, man. Definitely need some help um, in order to, you know, free up time to, you know, put out more content. Y'all see I, what I've been doing on YouTube, putting out more videos and all that. And so um, I'm definitely asking for people's help, man. It's been a while. Um, I kind of went without doing that, but please consider supporting us on, on patreon.com slash Adam Coleman. And uh, so we can keep uh, getting content out there, um, you know, consistently. So, I love y'all, man. That's another episode in the books. Peace.